Welcome to NFT Rebels, the podcast where technology, creativity, education, and non-fungible experiences meet each other. It's me, Annie Alexander, and in each episode, me and the Rebels will have a real unscripted talk, share genuine opinions, and show raw emotions. Should we start? Okay, hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the marketing. Uh, oh my God, it's not even more. Uh, I rebranded my podcast, so horrible mistake. NFT Rebels, of course. <laughs> welcome, everyone, to the NFT Rebels, and welcome to Josh Rosenthal. I actually met him, quote unquote, met him on Twitter Spaces, hearing how passionately he was talking about the art renaissance and the NFTs. And I just thought that I really needed to have him on my show. So for those of you who have missed that space, hopefully we will cover a bit of the conversation, but in a different angle from, from our perspective as well. Um, Josh has exited two startups. He's also a partner at the sixth event. So um, someone not uh, uh, an outsider to the crypto world, but also a historian as well, and, and loads of many other things. I feel like today's guest is very similar to to me in a sense that he's wearing too many hats. He's literally <laughs> wearing one now. <laughs> so welcome, welcome, Josh. I'm very happy to have you over. Hey, thank you so much. I'm, I'm pleased to be here and thanks for reaching out. I've been looking forward to this conversation very much in a number of different fronts. Okay, awesome. So I guess we can just start from the kind of usual uh, beginning point of how did you discover the NFTs and got involved with them? And then we can just, you know, roll from there. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's probably I came in through a, a, a different door, took a, a probably a different path. So you know, I'm actually a historian by training. And so a PhD in the field and then did a postdoctorate at France at the Sorbonne Institute for Advanced Study, which is like an interdisciplinary think tank where you're sitting down with a CERN particle theorist and a cultural anthropologist. And, and I was reading, you know, manuscripts, which were these privileged information pieces, and they were, they were illuminated, they were painted in very specific ways. And then those started to turn to printing and the printing was etched. And so that was my background. Then I went off and did startup things. And after the most recent exit, we're based here in Louisville, Kentucky, which is the middle of the country. It's not a power hub like San Francisco or New York. And so as we were thinking about you know, different types of, of entrepreneurial activities and how to help other people in those lines, uh, you know, the, the other models didn't really work. And crypto came on the scene. And when I saw it, I said, this is just like what I saw at this point of, you know, the transition from the early modern world to the, the renaissance and the recreation of culture and society. Um, and specifically, I came at it almost from the technological perspective first, saying, you know, in the, in the renaissance, we had this advent of ledger-based technology that gave capital to all these different communities and classes and gave a recreation of art. There's a rediscovery of technology in the art itself, and uh, the artists used that technology baked into their communication. And then there's also this, this opening up of communication around this permissionless protocol. And so I looked at crypto and said, this is just the only way to properly understand it isn't with the cypherpunks in the 70s, nor you know the 19th century telephone. You almost have to go back to the last time the world was recreated you know, at the Renaissance, where we had this fundamental unstructuring and bubbling back up. And then what struck me was when I first started hearing about NFTs, that was something new. I hadn't, that wasn't in the last Renaissance. Last Renaissance, we had finance, decentralized and communication, but NFTs were really different. And I had to think about it a while. Um, and what I came to the conclusion around was, you know, last time there was a fundamental power hierarchy in the Middle Ages, and it was unwound by these communities using the two tools of ledger and communication. And then it got wound back up and with the advent of the state, the exercise control, and the way the state was able to co-op that technology was through rights, specifically through rights in the real world and these documents mm -hmm. that I used to look at. And so when I saw NFTs, I said, man, this isn't just pixelated cats or what have you. This is, this is really fundamental. Um, it's actually super fundamental having on-chain rights to things in the real world, to digital artifacts. 
it, it gives decentralization to, to access and sovereignty in ways we hadn't seen previously. And then it makes sense from an artistic perspective, or at least, or at least how I had worked with art, which was around symbols and you know communicating meaning for construction and identity. Um, I said, "Wow, this is—it's not only financial, but it's a communicative uh, property of identity." And so the image is going to become more real than the thing itself in some way through this technology again. And so my mind just exploded, and I kind of came to the conclusion that when historians look back, they're not going to talk about crypto; they're going to talk about you know. NFTs. They're going to say the word crypto, but when they say that word, they're going to mean NFTs, which, so that's a bit of a long answer, but I came at it from a very different perspective, I guess. Yeah, it feels like, uh, yeah, it's it, it's a unique angle you're entering it from, and it feels like, you know, the diverse background that you have, with, which have been unrelated to finance, to crypto, to technology, is 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 uh, probably bringing these fresh looks and kind of, you know, a new perspective on, on, on looking at things uh, and looking at things from the cultural and historical, you know, um, angle. Um, so... You mentioned that those were not just uh, pixelized uh, kittens. Uh, did you start from cri the crypto kitties as well yourself? I, I did was way that... back, but yeah. So we had uh, crypto kitties. Uh, you knew exactly what I was talking about. Yeah. So we had some crypto kitties very early on, and it was just it. It's I'm old enough to remember what the internet felt like. You know, way back when, when all of a sudden I was you know doing a degree, and one of my professors said you have to be careful about this, um, this new thing that's coming out because people won't have the ability to peer review the concept or the idea or the image and you don't need permission to put this thing out. And so, and so, uh, you know, when crypto kitties came out, I said, this is, this is, it's, it's complete insanity. Even philosophically, you can, instead of just drawing a picture and maybe selling it in a gallery, that was going on on one side, but then with the web, people were using pictures to brand themselves or to market themselves or to project their identity. And now all of a sudden you could own your identity, right? You could own that crypto kitty on chain, which like that was, that was mind You could even breed them so they can be more than. <laughs> no, so it's generative, right? So then all of a sudden yeah. it becomes generative too. So instead of me renting an image and using that to, as a, as an asset and a technical transaction, all of a sudden I could own it and express my identity through it. And then it actually having it become generative and take on a life of itself, you know, both, both, both economically, but then also from a creative perspective was, yeah. It, yeah. So crypto kitties was the entry point for sure. And I know they went through yeah. a dip. I still, we still have the kitties and I, I, I like them quite a bit. I have to say just if nothing else for their, their place in history, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I think they were really cool. And also, like, I, I think the interesting thing was, like, you know, they kind of were more or less at the same time when the ICO boom was happening, right? Uh, yeah. More or less. And and the interesting thing was, like, they blew up and they brought in so many people who had no idea about crypto and later on maybe not even have touched any crypto after crypto hit is. But that, that thing itself, like, whether you call it a game or whatever, it, it it onboarded non-crypto people in such a fast way and such an easy way that it just made me, makes me think like how come none of the other projects actually managed to do that with the mass market, right? Because before and after CryptoKitties, nothing really blew up so much. Now it's happening with the NFTs and crypto artists, uh, kind of, right? But that thing, that whole thing, I mean, it felt like the barriers were more or less the same. They still had to have ETH to mint it. They still had yep. to have ETH to breed them and stuff yep. like that. But so many people just do it. They just broke the Ethereum network and clogged it completely. And, you know, nothing else was <laughs> happening while they were breeding those cats like crazy, right? So, no, that, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's so, it's so, it's, it, man, you're, you're getting right to the heart of it. I, so during the last Renaissance, like this idea of art, I mean, it. so this technology is unlocked and then it took this specific pathway. First, it was finance. So there are new financiers and they could trade on ledgers back and forth. And that's that was the advent of the new technology. And then, then it, when it, it changed the nature of work. So now I'm setting up a shop or maybe I'm trading or maybe I'm running a press or maybe I'm moving these images. So it went from finance to work. And then then out of that work, um, you know, there was there was this, it, it, it touched identity through these images. These were images, not just pretty pictures, but they had meaning, they were loaded with these semiotic charges. The image signified something fundamental beyond itself. 
They were used for constructing communities and identity and communicating the values. And they even had a bit of economics behind it as well. And so I think that's what happened with, you know, CryptoKitties are brilliant in the sense that it's fun, it's playful, but we're, we're following the same teleology, the same path or the same trajectory. Like crypto starts out, it's people trading tokens and ICOs. Okay, it's so abstract, I can't wrap my mind around that. Well, maybe there's a new way for me to make a living. Okay, so I can join a DAO or something. So that changes that nature. But the idea of like working around identity to say, here's something I can see. And this, this, what I see has meaning and it's connected to me, as you pointed out, not just by ownership, but just like in the Renaissance where the nature of creation changed, I have, I'm able to breed these or I'm able to mint or generate, you know, have like my, have an address on chain for a minting event and part of not just the provenance, but the creation. So it's tied to me in a really fundamental way. So on one hand, I think it's just, it's, it's less abstract. So retail will flock to it. But on the other sense, I think it actually is like, it makes me part of the story and the creative experience. And then it also is like how I define myself. And that's like, that's the superset. And so you put those three things together. And I think that was the, the massive use case for, for crypto. Um, and I think it'll actually subsume everything else in some other ways we can talk about as well. But yeah, I think you're a thousand percent right. Yeah, I mean, those were the days. Uh, I, I successfully uh, lost four crypto kitties because they are in a wallet that I can see. I can see how they look. Oh. They have been mine, but I don't have access to that wallet. So oh. uh, I'm trying to forget that fact because, you know, eventually, <laughs> eventually, I mean, they were not very rare, but like eventually even non-rare ones are going to be very valuable. So, um, yeah. I mean, not very smart of me, but but still, you know, at least I, I had them at one point, which is good. <laughs> no, and valuable for the the idea of, you know, people call punks cave art or what have you. But I, I mean, I think crypto kitties, like they'll have a place and in, in they'll, the, they're historically significant, right? I think they have, you know, they have meaning because that was the first, and if, that was the first time we ever interacted with that. And, and yeah, I think it's, hopefully you still have some floating around from then, so. I don't. Those were the only four. Oh, but man. anyway, yeah, I had anyway. two, and then I breeded another two, so it was kind ah. of a family, a family of four. But whatever, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to bring up painful well, memories. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, so, so yeah, let, let's talk about like you know, since we're kind of touching crypto and NFTs at the same time. Um, you, you know, I, I have my own theory, but I would like to hear yours in terms of. Why do you think, like, uh, you know, the NFT side of the of the crypto story resonates with so many people and so many people kind of, you know, got involved with it way more willingly and ha have al also kind of, you know, have uh, embraced the whole thing and, and uh, you know, became such a um, loyal part of the community versus if you compare it to, let's say, DeFi users, for example. <laughs> yeah. So it's when these technologies are, at least I can just say historically, what happened was when this new decentralized technology, you know, uh, gained prominence the last time, it was a small group of financiers, you know, it was still bigger than it had been, but it, you had to be in the financial trade to really understand it, or they gained some adherence, people came from outside it, but it was still relatively small, but that was the purest play expression of value, just being able to, it had the highest impact of transition, of transaction, right? So that was where it was just pure value created on that finance, and the same thing with DeFi, and in that sense, as the technology evolved, it made sense to pay, you know, crazy gas fees and what have you, so it always it always starts there, and then NFTs are you know broader based cultural adoption as technology is adopted. Part of the adoption gain is a step function where it goes behind people who are really in it for the tech itself, the geeks, and then it goes into the people who are really in it for the money. And these obviously overlap, but I'm just yeah, staging yeah, it. Yeah. And then people who join it for the benefits of it, they don't care about how they got there; they care about what it what it gives them, right? And so. Um, I think larger picture that will transform IRL or in real life, like crypto will act as this economic battery transforming the physical world through NFTs, which we can kind of get into. But the first stage of that is through these digital assets. And so people, you know, people talk about crypto and NFTs as if they're different, just like we talk about crypto and the internet as if they're different. But I think if you take a step back, big picture, historians aren't going to see them as if they're different. It's just we live in this weird little age where we're right at the beginning of it, right? And it's, uh, you know, we saw the, 
we saw the centralized internet with Web2, and now crypto is essentially decentralizing that stack from communication protocol to processing to even broadcasting through things like Helium. And so when it reaches its fulfillment, the, the historians will look back and say, no, no, the right, the real expression of the internet was crypto all along. We don't remember that little half-baked period, you know, in those 40 or 50 years. I think they're going to look back and say, we think about that as NFTs too. When we think of crypto, they're going to mean NFTs. They're going to mean on-chain rights, provenance, and creation as well as, of course, the, the finance, the, how you pay for it and how you communicate around it. But like that ownership and expression, that's going to be the rubric through which we organize. And so uh, number one, I think people are flocking to it. On one hand, it is the super set of crypto and that'll actually be a doorway into crypto impacting real life. But short answer, what most people, that's the big philosophical answer, which I firmly believe. But the easier answer is to say, well, Retail can understand one thing at a time, right? Coins are esoteric. That sounds like it's shady. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I can understand one thing at a time. And so like NFTs, I can't understand all that stuff he was talking about. Like I'm going to create new companies and we're going to organize around an NFT, like a noun or what have you. And that's going to be the rubric. And the NFTs are actually going to be tied you know, into the fabric of social tokens, defining DAOs. Like I don't understand any of that, but I understand a, a picture. I understand an image and I understand I can actually own that thing. And then that also coincides with like global events, right? Where things are shakier. And so now I might want to have the stuff I own because it's important to me as well as some assets like on a wallet I can take with me or hash up, right? And so I think it's largely, it's an image that people can see and they can understand kind of retail at one time. So the power of NFTs for people like you or me, or at least myself, like I'm super drawn to things like loot or nouns or any of this stuff because it's, I think that's the future, maybe not those particular projects, but they're the future in terms of what NFTs can do as keys to unlock this organization. But that's not what people understand right now. What people understand right now, it's open sea. It's like, give me eBay, I can learn one thing, make it digital. And so I think that's part of it. And then one other one other piece of it too, I think is as as we became bored, part of it was because we couldn't go outside, but part of it was just there's a changing nature of entertainment. I used to I used to bifurcate or hermetically block off my entertainment. I would see a movie and I'd watch a TV mm -hmm. show and I'd do this. And then maybe I might do some financial things. I might open up a Robinhood account or something. And then this all kind of blurs together as it becomes, you know, trading for entertainment or gameplay for entertainment. And at a certain point, I think at least in the US, people realized or are, were starting to realize increasingly, hey. I may have a Robinhood wallet, but I actually don't own that stock. I have an IOU from Robinhood that they can turn off at any point in time. So it's shared consensus. Yeah. I don't own that thing. It's, it's like the, the GameStop story, right? Yeah, the GameStop the story. Or, yeah, until yeah, then, so, no one really felt it and or understood yeah, so, it. As soon as so, it happens, they realize they, what it exactly. actually means. Yeah. So now if I'm going to do that, or even the dollar, as you start hearing this meme, money printer go burn, if I realize it's shared consensus, and I don't own the thing anyway, then maybe I ought to I ought to have my economic activity located in something that I like and I'm interested in. Maybe it's, you know, art or this particular genre of, you know, instead of having a, a piece of paper with an image on it, if that has the same societal and economic function as, you know, an image, which is on chain with an economic function to it, maybe I should start trading and and get involved with things that I like. And oh, by the way, it's a lot more fun doing that than just like trading Benjamins yeah. back and forth, right? And, it, and it's easier to spend, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> because it's, <laughs> it, it, you know, in a sense that people, people may think way more spending $200 versus oh. spending it for a gas fee to get uh, whatever, right? So oh. it feels like, you know, this, this mindset and this, you know, perception of how you value, I mean, put value to the things and kind of, you know, how if, essentially at that certain point, you're, you're spending the same amount, right? More or less at, at that point with the exchange. But like, if you had to buy shoes that are worth, I don't know, $200, $300, you would think way more and maybe not buy it. But if it's like a pixelized NFT of something, you would even not even buy it, you would pay commission to mint it, you know, as a gas fee just for that without even blinking. So <laughs> where, where does this phenomenon come from? Like, no, you know, a, it's a, oh, you're getting into it. So I think uh, that's a, so first of all, I think the NFTs are really keys to the metaverse in the first way where all the all the problems of it's always pros and cons, right? But the the trade-offs for real life, if I buy a pair of shoes or if I buy a piece of property, 
well, they get old, they mold, they wear out. I have to do maintenance on it, right? I have to spend time and effort. If I'm doing property now, the plumbing breaks or the shoes break and maybe they go, I, I, I have a lot of liability I take on with that, right? And so like NFTs being able to say, no, it's, it's easy. You spend way too much. But also part of that is, part of that is because it's digital. And then the other piece is like this idea of, I think there's an economic superstructure to it, right? Like if I buy a pair of shoes, maybe I can convince myself that they'll accrue value or something, maybe with cars or select assets sort of, but with an NFT, I can have that in the back of my head. But the third reason you said is super important. I've actually changed the denominator, right? I've changed like how it's denominated, right? And so like now I'm now I'm using not just monopoly money. I don't think it's just fake money as it gets, as it gets, the psychology isn't just, I don't spend real money in real life this way. So I, I have a cognitive disassociated, I have a gap in between it. I think it's much more fundamental than that. I think, I think we're starting to purchase, we're starting to construct identity through assets. Like we're starting to purchase things in a synthetic world. And so it's not just that I, I can't do the conversion of ETH to USD. It's fundamentally like I now have access to this new country, to this new world. And I want to plant my fat flag and I want to set up shop in it. And so to do that, I'm, I'm entering this other universe. And of course, that has other currency. And so I could connect it back to how much it costs versus rent or, you know, things in the real world. But I, I'm almost I'm almost at this point thinking about how I express myself in, in different realms simultaneously. So I think that yeah. I think the gap is is much more fundamental than that. It'll it'll get connected back again, but I think that's so part we're of getting it. so we're getting to the point where one ETH is one ETH. That's it. Yeah, right. Absolutely. It's we won't yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's almost as if I mean it, the analogies break down. I mean if you if you go to another country, you're always doing conversion. And then when you stay there a little bit longer, you're doing more conversion. And that's usually because those those are correlated, right? Those are highly, you know, Euro goes up, you maybe it goes down a little bit. But it's one, two, like overall global macro, it kind of stays, right? Well, these currencies, one ETH, I mean, that can be varied. It has a life of its own, right? So as yeah. I'm spending it, one ETH is one ETH. Um, um, I, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's, that's fundamentally part of it. Um, and then also as an economic wrapper, if I'm going to invest, it's not as interesting for a lot of people, retail first, to invest in, you know, just pure play DeFi exchanges. Like there's a high level of, Okay, if I move from spot trading into like, you know, doing curves on Uniswap 3, like, do, I mean, that takes like, that's like very esoteric. And what do I get? Well, I get a wallet and it has some numbers in it, right? I mean, that's, that's not as fulfilling as saying, I can still experience the, the economic upside. And a lot of people will tell you to invest in the currency at a fundamental level anyway, which is ETH. And I'm just wrapping it with these, with these uh, through a vehicle, basically, through an NFT. And so I'm not, in that sense, I'm not missing out. I get the best of both worlds. I, in the real world, you spend money. And in most cases, that actually is economically disadvantageous. In, in the crypto world, I'm spending ETH through NFTs. And that can not only, that's an open book. Maybe it goes down, maybe it stays on par with ETH as a dominator, or maybe it goes up. And so I think that's, there's psychological reasons, there's identity construction, then there's also economic reasons. And I think fundamentally, like when you go into a new world, you wanna you wanna stake your flag, right? And an NFT is a flag to say, this is my expression yeah. of who I am, and it's my my whether it's a CryptoVoxels coordinate or it's it's my geolocation on it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we titled today's conversation uh, that NFTs are sort of triggering the art revolution, right? Uh, I mean, I think it, it, it's like re a, a big revolution and art is part of it. So when, when you look at it, like... Um, we, we already kind of covered that, you know, when we talk about NFTs, it's more than just the art. It's more than the crypto art. There are loads of, you know, more things coming at it rather than the, the visual and the art piece coming from the artist. But um, if you follow the the similarities and kind of parallels with, with the Renaissance back in the days, the art Renaissance, many artists are kind of, you know, feeling super proud to be, part of this upcoming renaissance, which many predict to be even bigger than the previous one. So would you like to elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, ab absolutely. So this is, so first of all, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways we can go with that, but let me just take it on a couple different points. It's such a good question. <laughs> you're packing, there's a lot of things you're packing in that question. So <laughs> if you, okay. 
so on, on one hand, we can definitely say, hey, NFTs, you know, I think they're going to be the superset of crypto. They are going to be crypto fundamentally. If that's like the locus of your identity, uh, if that's where you visualize yourself and how you express who you are and take agency and, you know, exercise sovereignty, of course, that identity is at the top of the pyramid. And then how I pay for things, currency, and then how I organize to participate, you know, uh, DAOs or what have you, all that kind of trickles down. But that, 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 uh, that NFT is going to be around identity. And we talked about how it can be wrapped economically. And so you have this early phase one adoption curve for retail and what have you. But if that's like the superset, like on one hand, we say NFTs are going to be super expansive, right? The original ones like real estate. If it is an on-chain right for anything, it can be an on-chain right to an asset or experience that's digital or that's in real life. It can allow me to work in the real world and enjoy the fruits and the, the 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 metaverse, or work in the metaverse and enjoy the fruits in real life. So, or even intellectual property can be wrapped up that way. And so, I can now I have the economic strata to change both real life and digital world. So that's on one on one pole can be anything. On the other pole, like now that it can be anything, like the question is like, what role does art play in that? Now that we have this strata that allows us to make these connections. And when we go back to the Renaissance, it had a super specific role and function. And let me just take just a second to kind of explain what happened at the Renaissance. And so at the Renaissance, like each time communities, they unwound these power hierarchies of economic concentration and political concentration. And they're able to kind of bubble up and say, hey, who are we? How do we organize? What do we view as valuable? Now I can communicate information and value through these protocols. And so into that vacuum or into that potential chaos, like comes art basically. And like every time that happens, there are many renaissances before that. When we say the word renaissance, we think of 14th century Florent, you know, moving into 15th and 16th century. There are a number of other ones previous. Oh, that's the that. closest. That's why I guess. That's the closest, but it's also the most significant. It was so big. It overshadowed all the other ones. And the same thing with the reformation too, like that Luther and doing the printing press and the images and the flute trip. And like, it was so, there are many reformations, but each time they were stamped down, because the communities couldn't, you know, organize and resist this, you know, art was very 2D, it was flat, it was symbolic, and the powers that were dictated. And there was a clear line between creator and artist, between curator and the person who did the work. They were essentially, you know, craftsman versions of farm, they're farmers with, you know, finer pens, you could say, basically, right? And so there's this, this great disassociation. And so what happened was, it was so cataclysmic using this decentralized tech, not any tech, but decentralized tech, that it recreated the world through 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 reshuffling the economic cards, but also reconstituting culture. And that was specifically through the artists. So what happened was the Renaissance was a rebirth. It was a rediscovery of different source material and also these techniques. Even the ledger was around in Roman times. They finally you know figured it out again. Um, and so what happened was it was this this rebirth and the art itself was a rediscovery of technology. They're going back and rediscovering, you know, a, 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 techniques from late antiquity as well as new source material. So it wasn't just religious and everything else was bad, you know, paganism, myth, all of these other source materials were there. And when they re looked at, when they looked back at those techniques, they baked in the technology or art was, the tech was endemic to the nature of the culture as it expressed itself. And what I mean by that was the tech allowed new types of art to burgeon. So when we say Renaissance, we think of, you know, Michelangelo and, and you know, Florentine or Sistine Chapel or what have you. And that's true. That was a technology and it was also undergirded by, you know, this economic strata and they were turning back and the technology was, was realism. It was super specific. It, it was like, if you're a medieval farmer and you'd only seen a flat symbol and you looked at something, you know, one of these masterpieces, it'd be like you're looking into another world. It would be completely crazy. So that was one piece of it. And that's what we think about. But most of the art in terms of what people actually had in their hands and how it was a revolution came largely through the printing press, which sounds crazy. Because when we say printing press, we think of word. And that's absolutely true that art was word and it was super important. But also there was image baked into it, woodcuts or copper etchings. And these were these just dominated and took off like wildfire. It was like catnip for people. It exploded all over the place. And so that too was a new technology with the art baked in it. And at every level, what happened was the artists, the barrier divided between patron and creator, different people, the art became much more collaborative. 
they put avatars of themselves in these pictures. They put their images or their marks in it. I could play multiple roles. Um, you know, I could print, I could disseminate, I could evangelize. I could also do a little bit of art on my own. The art had, took on a life of itself. Instead of a medieval lord saying, do this in this way with this type of content, the content was fundamentally unlocked, as well as the technology to communicate at scale, as well as the economics to support those individuals. And, and those roles started to shift. And so now people are playing different roles. And so what happened was like, essentially the artists acted as both shepherds and prophets like within the, and I thank Tam Grin for this because she says it like beautifully well. Um, they, they took on this different role of interpreting culture and defining value as far as what we should value versus what we do and opening up different doors to different possible worlds. And, and so that was, they played a very unique function. The flip side of that coin was because that tech was decentralized, everybody in some sense became part of the artistic process in ways that they hadn't previously if they weren't outright creating. And everybody became an entrepreneur as well as the artist. Um, that's kind of when we say Renaissance man or Renaissance woman. That's a, you know, we mean they're doing a bunch of things, but they, they fundamentally were able to achieve their own economic, uh, they were able to, to, to craft their own economic fortunes. And so when we say NFT Renaissance or artistic Renaissance, the tech allowed the fundamental reorchestrating of culture and society. Artists were much more collaborative. They baked art into the nature of the tech, just like NFTs, tech baked into the nature of the art. There's a new economic superstructure, which allowed them to do that. The roles between patron and creator, you know, merged and morphed just like they do today. Am I doing it? Am I minting it? Am I, do I have downstream rights? Am I participating? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then it also transformed everybody to being participants in that artistic process, either actively or by default, and as well as entrepreneurs. So let me just stop there. But yes, that's like such a packed in question. I had to hit every level of it. No, no, but but it, it, it's very clear. And like, you know, the, the parallels are, you highlighted the parallels very, very nicely. And and I think that's, you know, um, most of the things that you mentioned are, are beautiful because they kind of, you know, they, they empower the artists. They, they kind of, you know, also are inclusive because not an artist can play a role in the whole process as well, because not everyone is creative or has kind of, you know, has tried or wants to create art. Um, but also the, the, what what for me is very interesting is that as a result of of this renaissance and probably the previous one as well we ended up with things that we wouldn't be exposed to otherwise like you know uh, there are so many nft you know crypto art pieces that I can never imagine seeing it anywhere in a gallery or a museum or, you know, any agent actually, you know, picking up that artist and, and deciding to promote him or whatever, right? There, there, there is a big, big group of different disciplines that would never actually be commercially validated. So, you know, people wouldn't even care and wouldn't even kind of, you know, put it under the spotlight or showcase it to the people. And now, like pretty much anything can, I mean, pickles are becoming a thing or, you know, we have all these animals and, you know, so, so I feel like uh, this is another thing that any sort of quote unquote weirdo and and a creep and an outsider and a person who was not understood because it wasn't he, they weren't producing like things that were within the standards and within kind of you know what society acknowledges as art now are out there and and then you know you end up with this question what is art like is that like what is art for you if you look at it that way yeah, no, that's a, that's a, man, <laughs> I'm going to try to limit my response. You, you, you touched on so eloquently so many important points, at least as I'm interpreting it. So let me just take one second and unpack like several of the things you said. That's one of the things sure. I find, you know, sometimes I'll dr drift into, you know, NFT chats or, or, you know, and I'll listen to them. I'll be like, man, I would love, it'd be great to have them kind of unpack this for people onboarding into it. And so like, I just want to take a minute because, sure, all right, so, so, uh, so a couple <laughs> different things like one, uh, so you had said, you know, the art seems weird and odd. And so, okay, let me start on this side. So one, when I, when I said, Hey, crypto allows this esoteric knowledge to be economically viable. It's like the pendulum of history swings to aggregation and that it means like, it means standardization, right? The easiest way to aggregate is to have standardization. So, you know, the work, the job, the finance, the transactions, the means the you know, production and organization, as well as the art, 
it all has to be kind of standardized. And by standardized, it doesn't all have to be the same, but it has to fit into you know, an, a mental grid. And some of the best art can transcend it for sure. But in general, in that world, like I'm working within a grid, right? And so, and I'm also working within that grid because my world is shaped by how I relate within this certain social structure, as well as the technology, which I use to create the art and to communicate around that. And so with, with distributed technology, all of a sudden it comes along and number one, it allows me to, it allows us as communities to completely unwind this hierarchy, our worldview, our cosmology, you know, especially when it's aggregated with aggregation at the top, the tech is, you know, anti-fragile resilient, so we can wind that down. So now, now we're not operating with a grid. Anything's possible, right? Is it chaotic? Is it crazy? It can be, I've, it's not just like I was predefined and I had to do something. The idea of doing something new never would have entered my medieval head, right? It, it's the tools of control yeah. were so strong. I wouldn't have said, oh, I really wish I could, you know, see this kind of art or, or, or work in this kind of finance. It wouldn't have entered my head. And so now all of a sudden when that's raised, now the world of possibility is open to do all of these different things, right? And so like in general, so how do I figure that out? How do I get a glimpse of what my possible futures or possible worlds could be? So like one, that's one of art's functions, what it means to me, it like shows me, it shows me possible worlds of not just, not just, uh, not just what's meaning in this world and how I relate to others or how I should relate, but what, what could be. And by using that, that technology, it, it seems very odd, especially when it's decentralized technology. To the power holders and the grid, the art is just going to seem odd and weird, right? Partially because the tech is odd and weird. So let me back up a step. When people talk about crypto art, usually the narrative is, oh, it's kind of like the Renaissance because people, you know, the Medici's made a bunch of money and then they wanted to buy their way into status. So they sponsored a bunch of these great artists and then everybody said, yay, you're awesome. And now you have class. That's not what I'm saying at all. That's like a false narrative. Like what I'm actually saying was the technology allowed these new players to enter the game. And then rather than just being Machiavellian and saying, look at me, I have uh, class and status. And uh, they basically use the art to create these, to bring in new content which was outside permission domain. This might be pagan and classics themselves reinterpreting, but then they use the technology itself, like the printing pieces, these crazy images of like vile things and unimaginable things. Um, they communicated these, these fundamentally like super impactful ideas that told people about their place in reality and what the possible worlds were. They, they didn't have to be at the bottom of a hierarchy. And so to the power holders, the, so to the people sponsoring that, that's super intentional. They're not just saying we're at the height of the pyramid. At least some of them are saying this pyramid is a false construct and here are these other alternatives. To the artists themselves, like it also, to the previous people at the apex of the power hierarchies, the art seems weird. It seems weird. The technology is weird. It doesn't make sense. They don't get it. It might be low brow because one of the tools of control that, you know, power hierarchies love using is, you know, this hegemonic construct. Like, crafting the window of what I think is right, what I think is wrong, what I think is high class, what I think is low class. And so now all of a sudden crypto art comes in and it's not, it's not, it's, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. My reality is completely deconstructed. So now I can build it back up in these other ways and art serving a, a fundamental function in that. And the tech itself is like fundamentally different too. Like I can participate in this, like generative art isn't just like, oh, that's super techie. It has like a meaning. I get to create and be part of the process on that when I'm minting something. And so like, I think it's so important when he said like, oh, it's odd and it's wacky. And, you know, maybe my friends in the old world don't get it. It's like, yeah, that's, that's a historical litmus test that means that something truly fundamental is going on. It's not just a fad, it's, it's super significant because it's odd in the nature of the tech recreating the way we think about the world. So that's like just point number one on what you said. I should stop there, but that's like such an important point. You just breezed on that, you just said it in passing, but it's like super important. Um, yeah. I guess can I say one other thing too, just expanding what you said, if that's art, so like now, the, the content of art unlocks. It's no longer just biblical images with a little bit of this or some pop folk culture, a bit of permission carnival popping up. Now all of a sudden it's, it's, it's these realms of story and myth and different, different universes, right? You know, the Greek universe and the Roman universe and this, you know, this far Eastern universe popping in. It's, it's these different worlds I hadn't thought of. And your life as in the middle ages, it was fundamentally like, there wasn't a lot of fiction, right? Your world was your world. The Bible was your world. You had plays and poems, but those were usually like morality. They were they were instructive. They weren't like entertaining. They weren't a synthetic yeah. world. And so now all of a sudden with the printing press, 
I, I have fiction. I can enter these worlds, right? And like, just like high res, you know, oil based, you know, ma masterpieces of the Renaissance were immersive. So too is fiction. I pick up a book and I'm in that like world I know is false, but somehow I'm, I'm there and participating in it. That was just that when I say open up possible worlds, that's what happened, right? Like a lot of people don't think about the printing presses as part of that artistic revolution. And so what was really interesting about that when you say revolution was there wasn't a market. The printing press doesn't follow classic economic definition of what should have worked or what the startup community would say worked. No one was literate. It's less than 5%, right? And so there is no market. And so they drop off the tech and the tech creates the market and people adopt and they learn how to do that. And like part of the driving, so that in itself is like giving me the keys um, that serve as these doorways into these possible worlds. And then I can step through these possible worlds. And so I'm not only going to a different type of creation and a different type of content, and it's generative and I'm interacting, but now I have a different type of, I have a different type of art, this print and this story and text. Yeah, we had manuscripts. They're very difficult to get to. If I went into like an elite archive in Paris, I had to wear you know a three-piece suit and have letters of introduction from like institutes and wear white gloves. And I was one of only three or four people who could do it. Now all of a sudden it's everywhere and you can write a poem or you can write a story and I have access to it. And so like that is art. We don't, we just like today, we think of NFTs as different than crypto is different than DeFi instead of identity wrapped with an NFT projected with art. And then basically how do I pay for it and how do I organize it? So too, do we think like, Oh, you know, visual arts are different than text or what have you. And like, I, I actually don't think that's the case. I think that will, that will eventually, you know, merge in our, our, our gridded construct, just like I was saying was a medieval construct, I think will, will dissolve. So that's, that's another like super important part and it'll dissolve under this rubric of identity and like possible worlds. So that's like the other imp super important thing you yeah. said too. Yeah, I that's think a long it's- a uh, sorry for rambling. No, no, it's okay. I, I think it's important uh, kind of, you know, to understand like the, the, the point that you mentioned that, you know, return art is, is no less kind of, you know, um, art than the visual art and stuff like that. I think what the mis biggest misconception, at least in the crypto art communities um, that we're having is, um, Many don't realize that the NFT technology basically kind of, you know, proves the ownership, proves the authorship and, and kind of, you know, leads you to any digital asset living on, on you know, the Web3, right? Yeah. So, so it can be anything. It, can, it doesn't even have to be art, right? It's, it, and, and the NFT and the token itself is basically showing you the path and proving the path and proving, you know, the... Uh, the authenticity, proving the you know uh, when it was created by whom, who owns it, and all that stuff. That's the record that the, the the token actually includes. But it's not the actual kind of the digital file itself, which mm. sits somewhere else. It's just showing you what it is. And when I discovered that, to be fair, honestly. Like I was so disappointed because I was like, you know, it it, it, it sounded so tacky and so dry oh, and so raw, right? For yeah, me, I was like, yeah. oh my god, like you know, I I I lost the magic of it. But if you look at that at it from that perspective and understand what it actually is, then you will realize, oh, you know, this is so valuable for Louis Vuitton. Now, like, you know, they can bypass these Chinese fake knockoffs. And, you know, when I'm buying a bag, I know that it's, it's the one, right? Or, you know, or anything else. So, like, you know, all these, uh, the, the sports, uh, I don't know, the football sports jerseys. Yeah, yeah, Chili's and Sokyo's tokens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, that's such a good, that's it's, oh. So it's yeah, everything, yeah. right? So, and then you can have these possibilities of all these different kind of NFTs and whatever, NFTs and DeFi, NFTs and sport, NFTs and entertainment, NFTs and music and whatever, whatever, whatever. So it's like, you know, it's, I understand that, you know, visual artists have been the pioneers of taking this and leading the way and kind of, you know, doing it and showing us how it works in practice. And there are many of them. But if you look at it from that perspective, yeah, I mean, it can be anything. And uh, it's not just about the visual art. So if you understand that and add different elements to it, I personally to me, like what I'm really waiting for and I'm exciting it uh, about is 
the mashup of many different elements, you know, the mashup of like kind of AI and kind of multi-format, multidisciplinary uh, digital storytelling, something, whatever. Like, I don't even imagine it's what exactly it will be, but like, you know, the whole thing of combining incompatible stuff all together, making something we couldn't even think would be possible or, you know, existed and coming up with oh. something that we've never seen before. That's what I'm waiting for. And I'm sure like many people are thinking about it and, you know, we will see many fascinating things we can't even forecast. Exactly. Like, you know, you mentioned loot, right? Who in the space who claims to be NFT artist actually forecasted this and forecasted what, you know, how it would blow up, right? I don't believe anyone could. Right. Even the founders probably, you know, they they hoped for this, but probably they didn't really expect it exactly and forecast it exactly how it would go. Right. So. So I think, yeah, I think that's the fascinating part, just not knowing what's coming and things move so fast that it's going to come soon. So, oh, yeah, that's so, like <laughs> there's like six things in there. So. Just one, it's really good for anyone listening who's not super into the NFT space, or even if you are, like sometimes we forget, right? And I, I just like, as a mental exercise, say it's a digital contract, right? If I wanted to see that I owned a piece of land in this crazy world, I'd have to go in to an archive or a repository or give me a permission man of letters to be able to read it. Maybe there was a copy, it was super expensive and da 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 It's like, am I talking about the medieval era or am I talking about today, having to get a contract with a lawyer, right? Like it's so permissioned by on-chain rights. And so like, if you say, no, I can have a digital expression of rights that covers anything just starting out, right? Like just as a mental exercise, working from the, the opposite of what the artistic audience would, would, I'm gonna get back to how that's important for artists, but just as a mental exercise, say I can have an NFT that covers a building a car, my deed, my car title, my intellectual property, my patent. The difference is it's not a document that resides with a lawyer where I file it with a nation state and then I have to exercise, you know, providence may through that. may or may not be corrupt as well. No, exactly, exactly. And it's portable now I ha and I, it's also visible. So how do I see that deed or title? Well, I talk to a lawyer, maybe I go through a government. I can't really see it. Those guys aren't, no, I can see it on chain. I have an address. I can see the provenance of it. So it, it opens up this idea of ownership and provenance, like rather than just being like, so, but the object that that NFT wraps could be physical as well, or it could be intellectual, like, right? Like that's great. You could have an NFT world where there was no art. It could literally be NFTs around real estate and cars and intellectual property. It's not a great world, but just as a mental exercise to say, right? And if you just pause there for a second and say, NFTs literally allow, you know, this anti-corruption they allow perspicuity, they allow me to discover it, and they have authenticity and veracity on top of it. Now I have all these tools to digitally communicate things and, that are in the real world that unlock assets and experience. Okay, now I point that to the digital world, right? And so now I can do the same thing there. And fundamentally, if it's the same thing, just like if, if cryptographic hashing communication, if it really doesn't make any difference, if I'm using R Weaver graph, or if, if it doesn't make a difference, whether the object of my information is words communicating ideas or, you know, digits communicating value, if communication and finance were communication worth value is really the same thing. So too, NFTs can be wrapped into anything, right? And so like now you take a step back and say, okay, that's interesting. It opens up all this stuff in the real world to bring it on chain. And as an artist, you might be saying, oh, that's really interesting. Wait, you're saying I can actually pull all this stuff into the real world? You know, the DeFi guys and the finance guys, they'll say, hey, the real unlock, the better ones are starting to figure it out and say, DeFi is really big, crypto can be really big, but if it's 2 trillion on 200 trillion global stock, 200 trillion you know, bonds, 100 trillion global real estate, and it's only 2 trillion, it's super small, but NFTs allow me to put all that real world stuff on chain, right? So like, there's like massive economic benefit to it. From an artistic perspective, if I can actually, if I'm doing art, like how do I have an economic transaction around that? Well, I have experience and ownership, right? And then you have rights and other stuff like that. Now, it might not just be digital in a picture. It can be a picture as it interacts with real life, right? So my canvas for creating art gets massively expanded. Everybody talks about the metaverse in terms of this world and that world and that world. That's all digital. 
And NFTs, maybe it's loot bridging that, it's abstract. Maybe you're gonna do it through, you know, ETH-based, you know, metadata or someone will do, you know, abstraction layer. Maybe it's something like Wilder where they have a protocol trying to connect it. Like, but the point of the story is like, what if the artist has the ability to create and transact around ownership and experience with a metaverse that actually penetrates into real life. And I can go back and forth, right? Like now that allows me to do all sorts of crazy things. And you're seeing, you're seeing that in NFTs with like, you know, purpose-built boutique displays or light or some of these other things, right? Instead of just yeah. buying a digital file and throwing it up on the wall, right? So like it gets much, much, much more expansive. And like tying to that mashup you said, that's where it gets like super interesting. Like so I, NFTs is the superset, right? I, I, I want to own something or have a right and own access to an experience. So then, okay, I have to pay for it. So I need currency. And then I, I probably want to communicate about it. So I need exchange. So like NFT is the core thing, like on the mash around that, allowing me to go back and forth with this stuff. It, NFTs literally allow me to pull in AI or to pull in real life. And in, instead of, you know, the old startups I did were AI based or their natural language processing. And so I'll tell you like that replaces people like NFT, you know, AI replaces your job, like AI in service of crypto, it expands your artistic possibilities and like, and who you are. And so that mashup is like just what happened at the last Renaissance. And like, when we say Renaissance man or Renaissance woman, that's literally what we mean. We mean using these other things and being able to pull it up and like, NFTs act as like the economic ownership as well as the technological infrastructure for doing that mashup in an advantageous way that isn't just for for aggregation. Sorry, that's yeah. like a lot of no, stuff. No, no, no. Which is thing. which is why I, I think like you know uh, I think by by what I said and by what you said it's it, it's eventually kind of hopefully it explains um, that. You know, the thing that the naysayer keeps saying, yeah, it's just a JPEG, I can right click and save it, right? So uh, I, I think that hopefully, you know, all these explanations kind of explain and, and, and bring more clarity in terms of why it's not just a JPEG. Can but I add I one more thing on that, on why it's sure. not just a JPEG? Because there's this one super important thing and like this may be outside your audience, but I just want to throw it out there because like I, I think it, Sure, go ahead. It's not outside the audience in terms of NFT, but for the artists, like, again, it's going to sound not artsy, but I think artists have an amazing, like, role to play in it. Just like you said, if they had, once they recognize this, then you have new tools to, you know, artistic tools to create. Like, so yeah. just politic, like, after the Renaissance, they recreate and then, like, the tools of the nation state re aggregate and enforce things. And, like, a lot of the political theorists, and, like, this was a bunch of my research was wars, religion, like, nation state. Like a lot of the, some of the political theorists will say, hey, um, let me take it this way. If you were in that era in the Renaissance, you had no idea what a nation was. The idea of a nation as a community wasn't in your head. You didn't know that you were English or you're American. That, that was like a new concept. It was basically a communication that a community that got together and imagined something. And then, you know, it was directed. There were, two, there were people, prophets and shepherds directing that the the teleological arc of where that thing went and then it was in their heads but then it was it became real because they they bound it with currency and they bound it with communication but then they really bound it they instantiated it into the real world meat space IRL through these rights through rights that gave them ownership and access to experience and so like if you take a step back and say hey crypto Crypto is like an imagined community, right? We get together and we go in there and you're saying, I spend this ETH and it's denominated in that. And like it exists outside of nation state borders. And we get together and we say, we have shared consensus that this is validated, that this has value, that we can build something on this. We can, we have shared consensus as a social layer, underlying coordination. Like, well, how does that get out of the mental realm? Well, one, it gets out of the mental realm by having a currency we do with cryptocurrency. It gets out of the, uh, the mental realm by having communication protocols, which are fundamentally decentralized this time around. Yeah. But then it really gets out of that by having an NFT, right? And so like literally uh, 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 ownership or access around that, right? And so like the reason why there'll be friction and you know uh, issues around you know, nation state and politics is because you know crypto, people talk about crypto versus government in terms of regulation and they think about it from an economic perspective and currency fine. But the reason why the potential for crypto and also the threat to the world, just like our medieval hierarchy, our current hierarchy, is that crypto is a new nation state. It's not just taking currency. It's actually taking this identity and being a different form of it. So if that's what an NFT actually does, 
it's damn well not like just a picture I can right click. It's actually this idea of like how we organize and have rights and communicate. And then maybe instead of having hierarchical you know, powers that became nation states directing where those communities went, like there's a role for artists to actually shape narrative, craft community and identity in a super fundamental way. So I apologize for interrupting, but just before we left that no, point, no, I want no. to say I, I get super it. duper like, important and no one, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, no one talks about, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like NFTs aren't, aren't derivatives of money. It's not NFT Phi. That's true. They're actually the superset for this historical narrative. And like, maybe instead of like royalty dictating which way this goes with state sponsored artists directing it, if we actually have decentralized tech, the artists can, 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 can help play fundamental roles in how we construct these communities in a decentralized way where we have greater degrees of freedom and sovereignty and agency. And so like, that's one of the, the roles of art. But just before we left that point, I wanted to say, you shouldn't be laughing about, uh, people shouldn't be laughing, oh, it's a cat, I can right click it. It's like, no, the NFT is ownership. Think about that. Okay, the NFT is ownership has an economic function that allows artists to actually get paid for creating value for the first time in a meaningful way because you don't have aggregated mediation taking it away. Okay, think yeah. about that. The next big level in this renaissance or recreation of like of culture and society, what role does art have in it? Well, as we actually are able to express ownership around that, rather than having it dictated hierarchically from on top, this gives us the economic decentralized superstructure to have artists express and play roles and acting as prophet, speaking words of like, not just truth, but interpretation of what is, of critique of what is, but also revealing vision of what could be. And then also shepherding and like playing fundamental roles and being able to guide and connect through those like, through those images and artistic experiences that have like, are loaded with semiotic charge. And like just this time, the last layer on this, I guess I should say is like last Renaissance, that's fine. This Renaissance, we're in like a hyper real world, right? It's like we're we're in like Baudrillard's dream, basically. The image is actually more real than the thing itself. And so we're communicating these images that have economic value. So we're literally giving artists like superpowers. So pick it up and use it. And be responsible with that power as well. Oh man, everybody talks about opportunity. <laughs> Nobody's talking about responsibility. That was like, I have yeah. that's, that's a separate topic. Oh man. Yeah, no, Make I think that's it. important as well. But but yeah, I mean, literally, I mean, what you're saying is the way I understand it. In the future, when we talk about you know nationalities or groupings of people and communities, uh, in the future, when this thing you know keeps developing, instead of being British, American, or Russian, we're going to be apes and penguins and whatever. You know that that's where it leads to eventually, because it's very similar to 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 that state. And then you know the artist will be shaping what what it will be and which communities it will be forming. So um, and and the artist will be shaping it because the tools, just like the tech, is baked in the nature. Because the artist is actually shaping not just with narrative, they actually have these tools that express like meaning and are like super charged. Like I fundamentally believe there's something about like, not to get super philosophical, but if you're into like media as message with McLuhan or he's, or, you know, it's like Baudrillard with image and hyper-realism. Like you'd say like these images are more important than, nobody likes the unicorn because it's pretty. Maybe they do. Maybe people pleasers like referencing medieval Bayou tapestry or what have you. But most people, when they see it, they say, oh, that means ETH and that means freedom and agency and construction, blah, 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 blah. Like, fine. Like, so like it's loaded with this charge, right? And now it's wrapped with an economic wrapper. So it's like Luke Bergen, like this Girard's mimetic value. Now I have like a mimetic, uh, you know, step up function of agency basically, right? Like, so it, they're, you're giving artists like, superpowers to shape that in like this world as opposed to other worlds. So it's not just like they're painting with oil, they have a broader reach, it's new contact. I'd actually think the thing they're shaping with is like a new hyper reality. Like even McLuhan, like the, the media is the message or it at least shapes or crafts it. It's like he's a big Chardin fan. And it's like these ideas of new spheres or like global minds that like become organization, organism somehow. It's like that essentially yeah. is the metaverse and NFTs act as like keys to doorways which go back and forth. And so artists have new realms to create and the tools mm -hmm. with which they create are like much more powerful.
So sorry, I just wanted to pause there because it's super important. No, yeah, it is important. So, um, so yeah, I think that's that's a really good time to sort of um, stop the conversation and segue to the Twitter Spaces because oh, what man, we do, we a, that went so what, fast, I didn't even yeah, realize it, that. it's been an hour. So, so basically, what we do is at the end of each episode, uh, after the live stream, we're going to Twitter Spaces and continuing conversation with the audience, where the audience can ask their own questions or participate in the discussion. So, I think. I think the point um, where we're stopping being that the artists have the superpower, I think it's the beautiful one. So we'll just, you know, keep it at that. Um, so yeah, all, all the power to you guys. Uh, you deserve it. So just let's see what you're going to do with it. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, so I'll just go and um, uh, just open up the Twitter space and we'll continue there. Thanks everyone for watching and see you soon on the next episode. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank <music> you.